Senate Speaker in Javier Magan, he will tell us a bit about operator growth at large end and emergent Poincare symmetries. Please, 45 minutes. So, uh, hello, everybody. I want to uh, start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to speak uh, in this very nice workshop and also for going on with the program in spite of uh, the global situation. I also wish uh, all the participants and their families uh, are doing fine in these uh, difficult days. So today I'm going to present a work in collaboration with Jean Simon. On one hand, it deals with the generic notion of operator growth, which has been used recently in relation to quantum chaos. On the other hand, and we will see how uh, both concepts are interrelated, it deals with the construction of an emergent Poincaré algebra, which we believe, uh, we, we will argue, is related to the equivalence principle uh, near the horizon of a black hole. So let me start with the plan of the talk. First, I'm going to describe uh, our motivations. And then And an open question was how to enlarge it to quantum field theory. In this regard, we will provide a generic formulation that uh, includes uh, previous ones as specific instances, but which can be used also in quantum field theory. We will then move towards dynamics and analyze the structure of operator evolution in the large and limit. Given this analysis, we will see how to construct an emergent Poincaré algebra out of the structure of operator evolution. Finally, we address questions that people have been thinking about recently, such as the putative connection between operator complexity and uh, energy, the connections between circuit, circuit complexity, operator complexity, and chaos. Okay, so let's continue with the, with the motivations. As many people in this conference, our motivations concern open questions in the context of quantum black holes. To have a concrete dual uh, conformal field theory picture in mind, we will be focusing in black holes in ADS, but uh, many of the statements are going to be generic. And this is because uh, we will be most interested, uh, as now I, I learned from the previous talk also, we will be mostly interested in the universal properties that appear in the near horizon region, which is the region uh, that I have uh, depicted here between the green lines. So, of course, uh, these universal properties are widely known and are the following. So let's first consider a Schwarzschild black hole. The function f of r is the blackening factor and it has a zero at the event horizon. Now, if we expand such a function to linear order around the even horizon, we obtain this metric here. And if we use now the relation between the Hawking temperature and the first derivative of the blackening factor at the horizon, and we also change the radial coordinate to the proper distance to the horizon, then we obtain this metric, this last metric here, which is just realer space time plus a transversal part. Actually, uh, this conclusion, this conclusion uh, turns out to be universal. We could have very well started with a more general black hole metric in generic dimensions, uh, this metric here. Here, f is again the blackening factor, and h is now a function that controls the asymptotic geometry. We can now repeat the very same steps, and, and we again arrive at Rindler plus a transversal part. We conclude that, uh, uh, that uh, we, we, we arrive to this diagram where uh, we conclude that, that the asymptotics is not universal, but the structure of the near horizon is universally given by uh, Rindler space time. So this is, this is, uh, this is well known. But uh, the universe, what is maybe less, less known uh, is that the universality of Rindler space time is actually connected to the equivalence principle. This is because once we have arrived to Rindler, 
nothing stops us from making a further coordinate transformation that uh, takes us to flat space. It is this, co it is this uh, coordinate transformation here. These coordinates, this, T and a, this new T and X coordinates, would be the coordinates used by a freely falling observer. Notice that this uh, coordinate transformation is like a time-dependent boost with rapidity given by 2 pi times the time divided by beta. And this is, uh, of course, the well-known well fact that states that the physical Hamiltonian describing the dynamics of the quantum black hole associated to a static observer outside the black hole, so in the case of ADS CFT, it would be the CFT Hamiltonian, this Hamiltonian acts as a boost in the near horizon region. Joining all these observations, we uh, arrive to this, uh, to this uh, universal structure. And a simple uh, but actually very insightful consequence of this structure is that perturbations with constant energy for a freely falling observer are exponentially blue shifted uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the time coordinate of the outside observer. And the time dependent exponent is given by two pi, two pi times the time over beta. So the main objective of today is to understand the roots of this universal behavior, which, uh, as we have seen, is related to the equivalence principle near the horizon. So a hint towards this question is that this exponential growth is very much reminiscent to chaotic behavior with Lyapunov exponent 2 pi over beta. And to verify uh, this expectation, uh, this connection, there are two different approaches. The first approach was developed in a series of papers uh, some time ago by Jose Barbon and myself. And the idea uh, was quite, uh, quite simple. We just make a conformal transformation from real space to hyperbolic space. This is accomplished by making a vial transformation to the so-called optical frame, which is uh, this metric here, and which just means uh, going to the optical mean to the optical frame just means dividing by the g zero zero component of the metric, and then approach the horizon again. In this optical frame, uh, one can verify that the dynamics gets mapped to particles moving in hyperbolic space. But uh, as many people know, this is the paradigmatic example of chaotic behavior. And the Lyapunov exponents are given just by the radius of curvature, which one can compute is given universally by uh, 2 pi over beta, as shown in this metric here. Sadly, um, we were not able to understand this in conformal field theory terms, although we will do that uh, today. The second uh, is the approach due to Senker and Stanford. They noticed that rate of shock waves are sensitive to the exponential energy blue shift. In particular, we have that the displacement in the, dis in the position of an outgoing particle due to the gravitational back reaction of an incoming one is proportional to the previous boosted uh, energy. More interestingly, they achieve a dual CFT understanding of this effect in terms of a square commutators or out of time order correlation function, an understanding which uh, ultimately allowed the derivation of the chaos bound. Um, but the question, uh, the question remains as to the conformal field theory origin of the energy blue shift itself and its associated classical chaos. Uh, I want to remark that out of time order correlation functions are sensitive to this universal behavior through a subleading effect, which is proportional to Newton's constant. And therefore, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, out of, this connected out of time order correlation functions die in a semi-classical approximation, while the previous blue shift does not. So in this way, we arrive to some of the questions that were motivating our work back, back then and, and are the following. Can we find the, conform the conformal field theory origin of this universal lucid effect? Is it rooted or controlled through the physics of out of time order correlation functions, or is it the other way around? What do we learn about the equivalence principle in the conformal field theory? So 
the first journeys into these problems were undertaken in these two references here, where by different arguments, it was proposed that this effect should be related to operator growth and circuit complexity in the conformal field theory. Related to this, uh, in JT gravity, the construction of near horizon symmetries was considered in this very nice uh, reference here, but we will take a different route and go to generic dimensions. So we want to, we want to deepen on the idea that spatial blue shift is related to operator growth in the CFT. In order to do so, uh, we need to, of course, we need to understand operator growth in detail. So let, let's first uh, uh, comment uh, the intuitive picture. So intuitively, operator growth refers to the study of the support of certain operator as time evolves. So a drawing is, uh, is given here. Although two operators might share no support at time equal to zero, time evolution might change uh, that fact. Of course, described in this way, this process seems somewhat mysterious. So let me say that before, before uh, let me take another path. Uh, before reviewing several existing notions of operator growth for spin systems, uh, an open question in this topic was uh, uh, also when we started our work, was how to extend this notion of operator growth to conformal field theories and also to generic initial states. In our work, we develop an approach in this regard. And uh, for the talk today, although usually one starts with simple examples and then move to the generic case, in this, in this context, it is the generic case, the one that is extremely simple to explain, both technically and conceptually. So we are going to start with it and then, and then see how uh, specific instances that have been considered in the past fall within the general discussion. Okay, so to define any notion of operator growth, we need the ability to expand a given operator in different bases of the space of operators. This allows us to quantify how the support of the operator changes uh, in the course of time. Now, assigning an operator size or complexity Sn to the basis operator On, we could define the size or complexity of a generic operator as a simple average of this sort here. Notice that the, 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 this uh, modulus square of the expansion coefficients can be interpreted, can be properly interpreted as probabilities. And indeed, it is simple to see that uh, the sum over all of them is constant when uh, we evolve unitarily with, uh, uh, with the Heisenberg evolution. So all these, uh, these, these, these two relations make us think that the operators have become states in some Hilbert space. And actually we are going to see in a moment what Hilbert space is that. But uh, before that, notice that in order to accomplish such an expansion, we need some notion of inner product, allowing, allowing us to compute the support of amplitude in the usual way, but this simple formula, where I have denoted the inner product between two operators by this familiar bracket notion, but without the sharp angle to distinguish it from the usual Hilbert space. Now, uh, having such a notion of inner product allows us to write the operator size, the operator size that I have defined here, we can write it as a simple expectation value uh, and actually uh, specific, more specifically, we can define a size super operator uh, in this way here, which is an, an operator that acts on the space of operators and the size is just the expectation value of such super operator. So if you insert this uh, super operator back here, then you can see that you obtain this formula here. So before moving on, let me do a very trivial remark, but that is uh, actually not so, I think not, not uh, noticed in the literature. So it is obvious from the, in this formulation that nothing depends on the chosen basis. The operator at time t can be expanded in many different bases and will remain, of course, the same operator. The size is also basis independent as it is transparently seen when we write it in this, uh, in this expectation value form. In particular, once 
we have solved for the dynamics in some basis, we immediately have solved it in has solved the dynamics in all others in all, in all other bases. Um, so I comment on this because in several places in the literature, certain local bases are considered kind of as more fundamental to study these problems. And our contribution today, as we are going to see in a moment, will be to study it in a different non-local one that greatly simplifies the analysis. So actually, if uh, we don't want to analyze the problem in, in other bases, like the one uh, many people, uh, the local one many people like to, to consider, we just need the inner products between different bases of operators. But this is, of course, uh, a non-dynamical technical issue. OK, so let's move to our, towards our proposal. So given the previous observations, I hope it has become clear that mathematically, the problem uh, that appears when we want to define operator growth is that we need to turn our operator algebra into a Hilbert space. But this is exactly the purpose of the Gelfand, Neymark, Siegel, or GNS construction that is uh, actually, uh, well, I hope, I, I suppose, very well known in, in Russia. Uh, let me, for the talk, uh, omit technical detail, uh, details that can be found in the article. Uh, and omitting these details, uh, the construction just goes as follows. Given an operator algebra and a quantum state omega in the algebra, the Hilbert space, uh, which is called the GNS Hilbert space, is just defined by identifying operators with vectors in the obvious way. So this identification here. And using uh, the state to define the inner product. So I define the inner product just by the expectation value of this, an expectation value of this sort. This approach is valid for all types of algebras, including the type three uh, algebras that appear in quantum field theory. It is also valid uh, to all possible states, whether mixed or pure. So a part of this, uh, let's say, uh, gener uh, general applicability, what is also interesting conceptually is that the GNS construction maps the somewhat mysterious notion of operator growth to a more conventional state evolution. In the GNS, so to a more conventional state evolution in the GNS Hilbert space. And also it maps the notion of size, which is a kind of somewhat mysterious, to just a simple expectation value of certain operator acting in the GNS Hilbert space. So there are now let's let's go to the specific instances that have appeared previously in the in the literature. So it is enlightening to see that all of them uh, fall very naturally in this framework. Let us do this for the second and for the samples here. So this reference, which is the the, the, the maybe the most known one, and, and this other reference here, which is a little bit more complicated. Uh, in the first reference, uh, it was con uh, a set of n Majorana fermions was considered, and uh, in this uh, this is a finite dimensional Hilbert space, and every operator can be expanded in the, in this uh, specific basis. Uh, which is basically created by an, arbi an, an arbitrary number of products of fundamental fermions. The inner product was chosen to be the canonical inner product for finite matrices, which is just the, this one here, which is just the uh, normalized uh, trace. And size was defined by this formula here. Now, uh, it is very simple to see that in the GNS formulation, this, exa this example corresponds to considering the full fermionic algebra in a maximally mixed state. Then we see that we have an equivalence of the inner product with the uh, GNS inner product and the, the previous uh, canonical trace for, for, for mat matrices. Um, also, the size would amount to, I mean, we, uh, we can define this uh, operator acting in the GNS Hilbert space defined here. And we see uh, that the size is just the expectation value of such operator in the um, in the Wolf uh, in the Wolf GNS state associated to the Wolf operator, which is this formula here. Let me stress again that written in this way, it is clear that nothing depends on the choice of bases. Let us move now to the other approach, 
So in this uh, couple of uh, reference uh, here, uh, see also uh, Julian uh, Sonner's talk, the Lanzos approach was used to define operator complexity in the context of spin systems. The, the main basic uh, difference lies in the, in the basis used to expand the operator. So now we expand it in this, uh, with what is called the, the Lanzos basis, which is uh, constructed by Grant Smith orthogonalization of, uh, of these operators here, which are chains of nested commutators between the initial operator and the Hamiltonian. This is an approach known in the condensed matter community due to certain advantages with respect to numerical simulations. I do not have time to go into it in detail, but we review it uh, uh, pretty much also in the article. The outset is that the Grand Smith uh, orthogonalization process, uh, so the, the outset of the, of the Grand Smith orthogonalization process is just this recursion relation, which uh, recursively defines uh, the Langsos basis. So we can keep, uh, uh, keep constructing it from the, from the first operator, which is the initial one. Given such basis, it is natural to define the operator complexity defined here, which is what these two references uh, do. Uh, it is natural to define the operator complexity as the average support in the Langsos basis, where the Langsos operator n has operator complexity n. So this, this is what this means. This time, the superoperator acting in the GNS Hilbert space that corresponds to this definition of complexity is uh, a little bit more complicated than in the previous case, but it, it can be constructed as well. And well, again, uh, the fact that uh, the complexity is just the expectation value of this operator highlights uh, its basis independent nature. So, before, move, before move, moving to dynamics, uh, let me just recap and uh, stop for questions. So the GNS construction takes as an input an operator algebra and a state on it and provides a Hilbert space. It does maps uh, operator evolution to a more conventional quantum state evolution. Then different notions of operator size are given by simple expectation values of appropriate operators acting in the GNS Hilbert space. This highlight the basis independent nature of this property. We have seen that all previous approaches fall naturally into this generic formulation, but now the approach uh, is valid for all types of algebras, including quantum field theory, and it is also valid for uh, all, possible, all, all possible states. So, uh, I want to stop just for a moment if there are some questions about, because maybe this was a little bit abstract. Uh, I would like to ask uh, about uh, the relations of this uh, just uh, abstract structure to the equivalence principle. You mentioned the equivalence principle and blue shift with respect to black holes, but equivalence principle is of course much more general. Would it mean that application of equivalence principle would lead to such uh, chaotic behavior just uh, generically? Uh, can, can, can I answer that question? Because that, that's the whole point of the talk. I'm going to, arrive, I'm going okay. to describe it in the, in the following slides. Maybe okay. if, if, if after that uh, you have still the question, uh, I can discuss it. Okay. But, okay. Uh, yeah. okay. Okay. So this was just uh, the abstract, let's say, um, basis of the approach. But now, now we are going to move to, towards dynamics. So in the Schrodinger picture of quantum mechanics, unitary evolution mixes the initial state with other states as time evolves. This Taylor, this Taylor expansion here makes it clear that as long as we know how to compute um, these particular vectors, which are constructed by acting n times with the Hamiltonian on the initial state, then we know everything about the evolving state. The reason is obvious is that these are the only vectors with whom the initial state mix through the through evolution. Of course, explicit computation of, of this state of these vectors here uh, might uh, might be extremely complicated, but these are the only ones we need to care about. Actually, a very uh, similar things similar thing appears in the Heisenberg picture. In this case, unitary evolution mix the initial operator with other operator as time evolves. 
again, so this is the, the Heisenberg evolution, but we can expand it uh, and arrive to this famous formula. And this formula makes it clear that as long as we know how to compute the, these nested commutators between the initial operator and the Hamiltonian, we know everything about the Volving operator. This is because, again, uh, these are the only operators with whom the initial operator mixes through uh, the course of time. So, of course, finding a precise, uh, this, this precise evolved stage operators um, uh, might seem very challenging in chaotic theories. And, uh, well, actually, uh, in the literature, for example, in this, in this uh, first article I, I wrote uh, some time ago, I obtained an understanding of, uh, of, this, uh, of, this, uh, of this precise, uh, let's say, microscopic um, so sac Hilbert space uh, evolution by making a Markov approximation in SYK for a many particle initial state. Um, in this second reference here, they obtain an explicit understanding of this expansion at large n and, and also at large q in SYK. If, uh, if this is, I mean, if these um, words are not known, I, 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 I don't have time to explain. I, it's just, uh, it, it is all explained in the article, but I just want to mention that uh, all, the, um, all the results so far have included certain approximations because the computations uh, are uh, well are quite involved in chaotic theories. In this uh, in this uh, reference by uh, by Parker et al, the the approximations were uh, were the same as in this one. So basically, large n and large q in SYK. So, but it it turns out that there is a simple solution for a big class of theories, and the key. So what this solution is to find the right basis in which to expand the operators. So let me let me discuss that now. So we want, uh, as 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 uh, as I hope I have convinced you, what we want to compute is this uh, is this series of nested commutators uh, with the Hamiltonian. This is because uh, uh, the reason uh, again I repeat is because Heisenberg evolution tells us that these are the only operators with whom the initial operator mixes through unitary evolution. And therefore, understanding these operators is enough to understand any notion of operator side of or operator complexity. So the, the, our, our objective now is that uh, to compute or to find an expression uh, for these uh, operators in generic large chain conformal field theories in generic dimensions. Also, it, it would be valid for SYK. So to do so, we first define uh, Fourier modes. So this definition works for any theory. It doesn't matter that it is interacting. And we can also invert this relation and uh, uh, achieve uh, this expression here, with, which we have used in the, in the case of a free field theory, but it, it also works in the case of a, an interacting model. The nice thing of this basis is that time evolution becomes trivial. In particular, the nested commutators with the Hamiltonian can be evaluated just by doing time derivatives. And, it, and this leads to, uh, to this expression here. But of course, uh, like it seems we have, we have cheated, uh, the point is that we have no idea in interacting field theories what the Fourier modes are. And in general, they are very complex operators. So it seems we, we just have traded the difficult problem of understanding the nested commutators to that of understanding the algebra of Fourier modes in an interacting uh, conformal field theory. But uh, although this is true for a generic, uh, I mean, this problem is a real problem uh, for a generic conformal field theory, this is no longer the case uh, at large n, where the correlation functions in the thermal ensemble can be written in this compact form here. Basically, the correlation function between, create, between what would be creation operators is zero, and the one between annihilation operators is also zero. And the cross correlations are determined in terms of a single function, g, beta of uh, omega and k, which I have defined here is just the uh, Fourier transform of the two point function in the thermal ensemble. These relations turn out to define the operators completely in the large n limit at temperature beta, given uh, this is because higher point functions of these modes, uh, one can prove, uh, we explained that in the article, but it was, I mean, this is, this is, uh, this is uh, known since a since, since long time, 
that uh, higher uh, uh, point uh, correlation functions of this mode follow from these ones just by using Larsen factorization in a leading approximation uh, in a one over n expansion. But now uh, we can remember that the Einstein thermalization hypothesis, uh, which is an, uh, a famous hypothesis stating that the expectation values of observables in energy eigenstates uh, approach the thermal value when the, th when the entropy of the system is large and when we are in a chaotic theory, as we suppose we are, uh, then uh, the, the Einstein thermalization hypothesis uh, imply that we know exactly how Fourier modes act or behave in energy in any energy eigenstate of the theory. And this is uh, as far as we can get in this approximation. So basically using uh, linearity, these expectation values uh, here, which are just controlled by the two by the two point function, provide a precise and, uh, and uh, I, I remember that the two point function uh, well is not known in every theory, but uh, it's known in many theories, like uh, 2D conformity theories, and also using holography. I mean, it's the, the important point is that it's, uh, it's just a, a single function. So using linearity, these expectation values provide a precise understanding of the series of nested commutators in most angle states of the theory at large end. So, uh, and I repeat, just depend on the two point function. So before moving towards application, uh, in, part in particular the one of the equivalence principle, let me, let me recap the logic described here. So Heisenberg time evolution tells us that the series of nested commutators are the only operators with whom the initial operator mixes as time evolves. But these operators have a very simple expression in terms of Fourier modes. This is generic for any theory. But Fourier modes are perfectly well understood at large end in terms only on the two-point function. This is interesting uh, in, uh, for the people maybe that, that, that uh, are not, uh, have not worked in this, in this topic. It is interesting because it was expected or believed um, that operator growth was ultimately related to connected out-of-time order correlation functions. Here we have shown that with the two-point function is enough in the large-end limit. Uh, let me also remark, maybe for the ones that are interested, uh, we explained this in the article, but uh, that these arguments can be run in the same, in exactly the same manner for modular uh, time evolution as well. So, okay. So now, with these observations about the structure of Heisenberg time evolution in large end theories, let us come back to our or original motivation, which was that of understanding the near horizon universality of non-streamer black holes including uh, uh, the emergence of a Poincaré algebra, which is related to the equivalence principle. So in order to do that, uh, I'm going to start with a simpler problem, which actually uh, we, know all, we know all uh, how to solve if we stop for, for, for one day, but which uh, will actually prove very useful. So usually when discussing quantum field theory through, the, through this diagram here, the logic of the, construction, of the construction typically flows in a specific direction. We first start with quantum field theory in Minkowski space-time in the vacuum, and then derive the state and fields in real space-time. But today, um, we, want to, we want to go in the opposite direction. So we want to start with real and construct the theory in Minkowski. So we are going to do that uh, now for uh, free field theory, which is, uh, after all, uh, as we are going to see, everything that we, that we will need uh, afterwards. So starting in Rindler means that our operator algebra is generated by creation and annihilation operators characteristic of free field theory. They have uh, canonical commutation relations, and the Hamiltonian is the conventional one associated to these modes. We also choose, uh, for obvious reasons, to put the theory on the thermal ensemble with temperature given by uh, this expression here, where A is just uh, an energy scale coming from the acceleration scale required to define the Rindler frame. So this is the starting point. But uh, as understood long time ago, see, for example, this uh, canonical uh, reference, um, 
about local quantum physics. This algebraic structure that I have just, uh, this, this starting point, implies a canonical duplication of the algebra. The easiest way to see this is by writing out the thermophile double, which includes two, copy, two copies of the Rinder field theory, but there is a more intrinsic algebraic perspective. We review this uh, canonical duplication in much more detail in the article, but uh, it is also uh, uh, widely known and, and maybe it's better you can also check the standard, this standard reference here. The outcome is that a new set of creation uh, annihilation appears, which I have called now with a left um, subscript, uh, superscript, which we can think to be attached to a left wedge. They have canonical commutation relations, are placed at the same temperature, and commute with the operators in the right hand side. The state, also, this is widely known, the state, when considered over both algebras now, uh, over the algebra generated additively uh, by arbitrary products of the left and right, becomes pure. This again can be proven just in algebraic terms, but for the talk today, it is simpler to give the explicit uh, famous uh, thermophile double form. This thermophile double reduces to the appropriate thermal states uh, at its side. It also, uh, this thermophile double also allows us to verify in simple terms these uh, insightful relations here, which show how the action of operators in one wedge, say the right wedge, can be mimicked by the action of operators in the other ways. These relations here uh, suggest to define the state, the thermophile double, which I have called zero M for, because of course it will be the vacuum in Minkowski uh, with respect to some new, newly defined uh, modes. So this, this, this relation here suggests to define um, a new set of creation annihilation operators, these ones that, uh, that I have defined here, which we recognize as the UNRU modes. So we started in one wedge in the thermal state, canonically purified to obtain the second wedge, and we all agree that we should have now all the tools to construct uh, the quantum field theory in Minkowski space. So now, uh, although in the present construction, uh, this definition here, might seem like a, a magician taking a rabbit uh, out from his hat. Um, let, me, let me actually do it. Let me define this uh, horrendous formula where we have defined this function here. And when we recognize the, here the dispersion relation of a massive scalar fields. So of course, these modes naturally, naturally evolve in a new time direction generated by their, their canonical free Hamiltonian. And uh, it is also natural to define a generator, an, a generator of translations in the set level, again given by a canonical expression in, the, in, the, in terms of these new modes, which uh, I remember are fully determined in terms of the, basically in terms of the right modes, because the left ones uh, were um, also derived from the right ones. So uh, finally, uh, to, the, to, to, to end with the construction, we can further define an operator which leaves the thermophile double invariant, but which acts as the Rinder Hamiltonian uh, in each wedge uh, separately. So this is, of course, this will become, of course, the boost operator in the quantum field theory. But the interesting thing that I just want to remark is that if we have done all things correctly, we should arrive to the commutation relations of the Poincaré algebra, which are given here, and the fact that the vacuum is a, is a vacuum for, the, for these uh, new modes. The interesting observation, uh, which contains uh, nothing new, is uh, almost trivial, is that one can verify such commutation relations, so all this here, such commutation relations, just from the relations uh, of the algebra of creation and elation operators in the right Rinder frame alone. So from the present perspective, everything secretly rests on the information pertaining to a single Rindler wedge. So let me summarize the logic. We started with a single wedge by, uh, and the algebra in it. By the canonical doubling associated to algebras in thermal states, we went to two Rindler wedges. By a certain mysterious variable redefinition, we recover 
the Poincaré algebra and the full field theory in Minkowski space. This construction is the quantum field theory analog of the simple diffeomorphism presented earlier that takes us from the real frame to the Minkowski frame. The important lesson here is that uh, all the Minkowski field theory and commutation relations secretly rest only on the free mode algebra of a single uh, Rinder wedge. So is there um, any questions about, uh, about this? If not, uh, uh, I continue and now, uh, I really come back to our original, uh, our original problem. So before uh, we saw the convenience of using the asymptotic modes of the fields for understanding operator evolution upon, and potentially, as we are going to do in a moment, operator growth. So we would like, of course, to use that knowledge in order to understand the problems described at the beginning of the talk, which are uh, basically depicted in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this drawing here, and where I also uh, inserted these uh, Fourier modes that now we more or less understand. But uh, as we have, uh, we have seen, it turns out that these modes satisfy uh, quite, quite a complicated algebra. I mean, a simple algebra from the point of view of operator growth, but a complicated algebra in the sense that uh, the commutation relations are not canonical. They are uh, a complicated functional of the, uh, the two-point function. So, so this algebra depends non-trivially on the two-point function, and we would like canonical commutation relations. In a way, this was only expected as these modes are only asymptotic and we only expect certain universality for near horizon modes as, uh, as was described in the, in the previous talk. So basically we would like the, uh, the modes that are natural for the near horizon region. So it is quite convenient uh, that both problems share a single insightful solution which uh, So the solution is uh, to renormalize the modes with a mode dependent factor here. So of course, uh, from the field theory point of view, this renormalization is not very much uh, justified, but it has the nice feature that we were looking after, uh, after that now the algebra of renormalized modes, given here, is just the algebra of uh, free fields at finite temperature. But the interesting thing, which makes everything uh, consistent uh, from our point of view, is that uh, these renormalized modes um, are actually the modes which are canonically normalized in the, near, in the near horizon region. This was shown in this paper. And are thus, uh, uh, thus the natural modes there. So the fact that the algebra of renormalized modes does not depend on the two-point function just expresses the But now, uh, I hope uh, we all agree, we have all the ingredients in order to construct the emergent Poincaré algebra. So if we start in a thermal state of the right conformal field theory, we just need to follow exactly the same steps as before for the quantum field theory in Minkowski, but just replacing the right Rindler modes with the renormalized uh, CFT modes in the right conformal field theory, and also replacing um, the acceleration of the Rindler frame with uh, two pi over beta. If we do this, now canonical duplication of the modes provide uh, uh, some modes which are renormalized in the left, in the left wedge. And exactly with the same definitions in terms of, uh, of the right uh, modes, we can, and just by explicit computation using the algebra of the normalized modes, we can verify the Poincaré algebra. So now in the of pure state black holes, dual to one boundary, we, we uh, do basically the same. We again start with the same identifications, but the problem appears in the step of canonical duplications, which is much more subtle as this, uh, as, and was the, basically the main content of this reference. I, I'm not going to describe that uh, here. There might be potential problems about that, but ne neglecting uh, putative problems associated to such construction it turns out that the outcome is conceptually the same. We obtain a set of new mirror operators that play the role of renormalized field modes in the left wedge, 
And again, using the same, the very same definitions with the left modes replaced by the mirror modes, we arrive to an emergent uh, Poincaré algebra. So, okay, uh, let me let me do a cap of this part. So we first saw how uh, starting with with a Rinder wedge, we can construct quantum field theory in Minkowski space. This is the quantum field theory analog of the simple diffeomorphisms that takes us from Rinder to Minkowski. But we have seen that all what we needed for that construction was the algebra of free creation and elation operators in the right wedge. But this is actually the same as the algebra of renormalized field modes in large chain conformal field theories, which are actually the natural modes uh, appearing uh, canonically normalized in the near horizon region. So we can thus easily transport the definitions from the known scenario to the unknown one. And uh, we believe uh, this, is, uh, this is related, this is what is related to the equivalence principle at the horizon. So I don't know if I have answered uh, the, 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 the question that was done before, or at least uh, improved the understanding. Oh, well, well, you just mentioned here that you are, um, uh, that, uh, go from Rindler to black holes, right? And yeah. Is it, is it really necessary? Just because, because it seems that there, uh, up to now, only Rindler was necessary, right? The acceleration. So you can apply to black holes, but <laughs> so is it possible to apply uh, for some other cases? Well, I have. Ah, uh, well, yeah, for, for, yeah for, for example, for modular uh, time evolution. So it, you can apply, you can apply, you can, you can do that. So that, okay, let me just uh, make the generic, generic answer. So you can uh, apply all this construction whenever. Um, whenever uh, you have certain canonical commutation relations. And this, uh, the, our point is that these canonical commutation relations appear uh, universally. So, of course, for free field theories right. that we already knew, yeah. but also uh, appear naturally in, in large chain field theories when, when you have large chain factorization. Uh -huh. And that can be applied uh -huh. to thermal states, uh -huh. which could correspond to black holes, uh -huh. but it could also apply to, um, to um, let's say when you when you have a field theory and you reduce your your state you, you can be in the vacuum not in a thermal state you are in the in the vacuum but you reduce to a to a certain uh, subregion and then you have a modular Hamiltonian uh -huh. and then your your natural modes in uh, which are evolved with that modular Hamiltonian are in a thermal state uh -huh. with respect to the modular temperature and you can uh, if, if the theory is at large chain, again, you can define uh, canonically renormalized modes uh -huh. that, uh, that actually are related to the fact that in the, in the bulk, you would also have a, like kind of a, what is known a hyperbolic black hole, which uh, also has a, a real there near uh, approximation. Uh -huh. So basically, I mean, we are of course not 100% not, not sure, but the claim is that um, the universality of um, the equivalence principle is um, so the fact that you can always find a, a flat uh, approximation to the metric mm -hmm. is related to the to the semi-classical approximation, and to the fact that you can always uh, do this uh, do this game with this uh, kind of um, thermophile double trick. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh -huh. I see. I see. Okay. Uh, yeah, the trick is very nice because sometimes you may observe <laughs> uh, just some uh, a kind of interplay between uh, flat flat space and and just conical singularity and this doubling, I think it's, it's, it's clarified <laughs> the origin. Okay. This, this, this doubling, the, 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 the nice thing is that this doubling is a very, I mean, it's, uh, it's like, it's, it's, it's uh, very much well studied and is perfectly known since already some time. So I we see, are, uh, see, and, it, and, and, and it was, I must say that it was, uh, So this was this this was one of the objectives of the um, of the article and of the talk. Now let's come back to the other. So the issue of operator complexity in the light of the previous results. So we saw that we could define size or, or operator complexity as the expectation value of a size superoperator 
and that this def, uh, definition uh, makes it clear that uh, it is independent of, on, of the basis we choose to expand the operator, the evolving operator. We can thus express it in any basis. And in fact, the most convenient one is as a function of the field, of, of the field modes themselves, both in the right conformal field theory and in the duplicated conformal field theory. So this super operator I, I, is a fun, it's just the most generic super operator uh, in the GNS, acting in the GNS Hilbert space. It, of course, uses modes in the right wedge and modes in the left wedge. Now, uh, if we define such super operator as the previously constructed Minkowski Hamiltonian, then due to the Poincare algebra, we see that the size grows exponentially fast with the right Diapunov exponent. And this is, of course, the right definition in order to have a match between size and infolded proper energies that was uh, described in the motivations. In the paper, we, uh, of course, here is a little bit arbitrary, and, there, uh, and therefore, I mean, in the paper, we, we also explored other natural choices, but they actually did not provide the desired exponential behavior. So it is quite a, a kind of, a, so it depends on the definition of the operator. Notice that the key of the simplicity of our construction and analysis lies in the choice of basis. In the literature, uh, people have used uh, local bases constructed by arbitrary products of local fields at different points of space. We remark again that the choice of basis is by no means significant, significant. I'm sorry if I'm uh, repeating myself a lot, but uh, it is one important, very important point that actually in the literature is confused, is confusing. The dynamical problem is fully solved by the evolution of the field and the choice of the super operator, say the Minkowski Hamiltonian, as we have done just before. Once we have those, we have we have those, we can expand both of them in any new basis of the operator algebra just by computing the inner products uh, between between both bases. Uh, this one's given here, but this is not dependent on the dynamics. The dynamics has all have been uh, already solved. So to illustrate an example of this. Uh, of this just that we just need to change the basis, we can apply the previous knowledge to solve the Langsos approach in the large end limit. So as described earlier, this approach uses a different basis to expand the evolving operator. This basis is constructed by Grand Smith orthogonalization of the operators ON, the, which are the series of nested commutators between the initial operator and the Hamiltonian. The solution, as I mentioned before, uh, is just this recursion relation. So now, uh, um, now we consider uh, an initial operator of this of this form, which is a typical um, uh, typical operator in a free field theory, which is uh, natural in the basis, uh, uh, which is natural at, at that end. One can then solve the previous recursion relation by uh, by induction and obtain the generic form of the Langsos operators of the Langsos basis as a function of certain polynomials that are complicated but are in the article. Um, but uh, as a function of the creation and annihilation operators, they have a simple form. Now, to understand the, span the expansion of the evolving operator in this new uh, Langsos basis, we remember that uh, we first remember that we know the evolution in the basis of field modes, which is just given by this simple expression here. So now the expansion coefficients can be easily compute by direct computation of the appropriate inner product here, which uh, we can, which it can be done because we have the relation between the Langsos basis and the field modes, and we get these uh, these results, which are not very enlight uh, enlightening by themselves, but uh, show the 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 fact that the that the problem was solved by this simple solution. Another application concerns the relation between circuit complexity, chaos, and operator growth. The connection between complexity and chaos was developed in this first reference here in collaboration with uh, Pablo Bueno and Carlos Sabasi, follow, following ideas from an earlier paper uh, of mine uh, back in 2018. The idea is to formulate a conventional chaos setup, but instead of a, in a classical phase space, in the Hilbert space. So we do that in this drawing. So we start with two states which are very close to each other. One of them can result as a small perturbation of the first one uh, by certain small perturbation. 
And now we can then evolve both in time with the very same Hamiltonian as we would do in a typical chaos scenario. Now we can define suitable notions of distance that keep track of the chaotic behavior. These notions of distance in the Hilbert space by following Nielsen's geometric approach to quantum complexity that was described, uh, for example, in, in Johanna's uh, uh, talk earlier in this conference and, and also in, in Mika's talk, can be properly interpreted as notions of circuit complexity. In this case, uh, uh, this complexity is the complexity to go from one state, from one of the both states, to the both states. Basically, what we are computing is the complexity of this unitary transformation that we need to find. Um, as we highlighted in the reference with, uh, with uh, Bueno and Sabasi, the result is highly dependent on the distance function. Some notions might not provide any growth at all. But uh, contrary to common intuition, this occurs as well in classical physics, where people are usually a little bit sloppy when stating that trajectories separate exponentially fast in phase space. So if you think it, uh, this, uh, it was nice to learn it uh, uh, one year ago, that uh, if, if, if you consider the chaos problem in a classical setup, in a classical phase space, when you say that the, the two uh, trajectories separate, usually this doesn't refer to a, you, you, have no def you have not defined a proper notion of, dis of distance in the phase space. Because in the phase space, what there is a, a, a canonical notion is a symplectic structure, but not a, a metric. And then when you attack the problem of defining a metric, uh, you, you might see the same, the same problem. So in the article, we noted that notions of, um, of operator size and operator growth might help to provide good notions of distance in the Hilbert space, in particular, if one defines the local metric by means of the operator size, um, we get a direct match between size and circuit complexity. In this scenario, using the, using the previous results we found for the size, we would obtain relative complexities that increase exponentially fast with the right Lyapunov of exponent. We want to remark that we did not require any mysterious conjecture about holographic complexity. Here we are finding the circuit complexity and the size both in the bulk and in the boundary from first principles and at a strong coupling. And with these observations I finish, let me just remark the takeaway messages. Operator evolution is fully determined by the Fourier modes in all theories. At large end, Fourier modes are fully determined by the two-point function. Given this observation, operator growth is just controlled by the two-point function. In the way uh, of developing this, these results, uh, we realize that in order to define operator growth in quantum field theory, one can use, uh, it is very nice to use the GNS construction, which maps operator evolution to state evolution, and it is valid for uh, uh, quantum field theories and also for all states. As applications, we saw the implications of this structure through the Langsos approach, uh, and we clarify the relation between circuit complexity and operator growth. We also describe these uh, emerging Poincaré symmetries and uh, put uh, interesting potential relations with the equivalence principle. Finally, although I did not have time, the understanding of the near horizon physics immediately provides an understanding of the classical chaos near the horizon described in the introduction. In the introduction. This is because now we have all necessary tools, all the necessary tools to construct the conformal tra transformation from real space to hyperbolic space. And with this, I finish and thank you for the attention. Okay, thank you very much for your interesting talk. Any question, please? In any case, we are over time, so we uh, left maybe five minutes. So maybe two urgent questions or just a very long one. <laughs> okay, please. I have a question. Uh, so, uh, does your uh, construction of the Poincaré uh, algebra uh, coincide with the uh, uh, lin moldasien ajao construction in the uh, ADS2 case, right? Did you check it? Uh, we we did. I mean, we are we are not sure, and we are we we. That's one open question because we we follow a completely different approach, and actually uh, they. Um, Um, they 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 actually relate very much. One thing that is different, and we don't under, and we are, that's that's the main question we are we are uh, we are working on, 
is that uh, they basically relate the near horizon symmetries to uh, the chaos, I mean, the chaos understood as uh, out of time order correlators in the field theory. But we believe this is, uh, this is too much to, to I mean, th this, is, this is not needed. So if you remember one of the questions that, we, that, uh, that I just uh, explained in the introduction was if the construction of Poincaré symmetries is, um, is uh, connected to the fact that, uh, to, I mean, it's, uh, it's really derived from, uh, from, the, from, out of, from connected out of time order correlation function. Right. What we have shown here is that that is not needed. And uh, we have also done uh, a very canonical, um, let's say, uh, construction of the symmetries. They, 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 they use uh, chaos in a way that we still don't understand and we don't, I mean, I would say, I don't believe it's completely necessary. So may, uh, I would say that, uh, that uh, yeah, that uh, we are working on that and, and it's an interesting question. I, I, I'm not completely sure. Uh, okay, so uh, as a second part, I was going to ask uh, about the, specifically about the time translation generator because they have this uh, term in the explicit formula, which uh, corresponds to the, which is essentially a coupling, a coupling term for the two boundary theories, which makes the uh, wormholes traversable. So, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That works. That works as well completely. But it's, it is a very it is a very uh, specific one. So I mean that's that that's our point that uh, they they studied very generic connect uh, very very generic uh, um, terms that connect the two boundaries, uh, and uh, I mean so. A, 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 a question in, uh, to their paper would be if, if, you, if you have found such a, such a genericity in the construction of near horizon symmetries, in principle, you could use that to construct many, I mean, you could take that to, to, the, to the simplest scenario of Riddler quantum field theory, and, I mean, and quantum field theory in Minkowski, start, starting with Riddler, and then defining this, this Hamiltonian, you would find many Hamiltonians associated to the Minkowski time evolution. And that uh, I still don't understand. I think it must be some, something some, uh, uh, kind of incorrect because we know that in quantum field theory, we have, I mean, in Minkowski space, there is a, a single Poincaré algebra as, and a single vacuum, and it's all very robust. No, it's not that you can do many things to arrive at the same, at the same point. So one possibility that is uh, what we are trying to understand is whether their construction is some kind of ultraviolet construction, and in the ultraviolet, I mean, in the let's let's say it's, it's some kind of finite end construction in which you have you may have many possibilities, and when you take the large end limit, all of them converge to one possibility, which is the one we are studying, because we are studying only the large end limit. Uh, I don't know if that that uh, is, uh, a little bit explained the question, but. But it is, it is true that the, the, the Hamiltonian connected both boundaries, in our case, is a very explicit Hamiltonian that comes uh, quite canonically from this, uh, from this uh, argument and this duplication. And uh, it also, does it also introduce uh, like the negative energy in the, in the bulk if we, talk, if we talk in terms of a traversable wormhole? Is it, uh, can you tell? I mean, the, I, I'm very skeptical about these negative energy things, and actually, there is a nice, very nice explanation in the in the in the in Baldassena's near horizon symmetry paper because when you write it as a, as, as near horizon symmetries, uh, uh, the, um, the 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 point of, of of having negative energies is just that you you can understand that as just evolving uh, backwards in time with the Minkowski Hamiltonian. So I would say. Uh, I, I would say to uh, answering to your question, I would say yes. You can you can get that. You just need to evolve back with the uh, Minkowski Hamiltonian. That that uh, that uh, backward. So you can just you, you just have to use minus h instead right, of h. Right. Yeah, yeah. And and if you do that, then you then you then you then you uh, then you have a, a negative energy subweights, and you can you can cross from one side to the other. And if you just take H, the, what the one I take it, then 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 you won't be able. Okay, thanks. Okay, maybe last question.
Okay, people are tired. So if no more questions, let's thanks Javier for a very interesting talk. Uh, thank you very much for everybody.